Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Ellison and I'm here with Inside the Outdoors and today we are going to get to do a really fun science program. Not only today but for the next few months, me and my friends with Inside the Outdoors are going to be here at the Anaheim uh, studio to be able to share some science projects with you as well as to get to interview some of our favorite guests and hear a little bit more about what they do for their careers and how they got there. So today, we're going to be talking all about birds, one of my most favorite subjects. And we can't wait to be able to share this with you here today. But not only can you do it um, with us here during this program, but after today's program, you can use the link in the description to be able to view um, some of our backyard missions and be able to continue learning at home as well. I want to go over, before we start, I want to go over some ways that you can communicate here with me today. I have my friend, Miss Brown, who's on our chat. So she's going to be reading our chat here today. If you have any questions for me, she can go ahead and relay those to me. If you have to answer any of our questions as well, I'm going to ask you some questions. You can use the chat to um, respond to those too. So those are some ways that you can communicate with me. And I'm really, really excited to be able to do that here today. I can't wait to learn all about birds with you, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce our special guest for today. My special guest is Miss Lauren Single Singleton, and she is a biologist, and during her job, she actually gets to work with birds. So we're going to get a chance to be able to talk to her about her career and ask her some questions about how she got there and what her favorite parts are. So we're going to go ahead and go over to her now and introduce ourselves to her. Alrighty. Hello. Are you able to hear me? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Great. All right. Miss Singleton, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little more about your job as a biologist. Sure, definitely. So I'm a, I, I'm a biologist, but I'm not really specific about anything. I actually study all different types of plants and animals. One of the big things that I do study are birds. So I'm glad you're talking about birds today. Um, and, you know, since I was little, I've always enjoyed watching um, animals and looking at plants and especially when I was really young, I loved the beach. I thought I was going to be a marine biologist and study the ocean. And then I realized when I went to college, I can actually study everything. And so now that's what I do is I study everything. <laughs> Sounds like a really good job. How did you know you wanted to do this? Well, I just, I always loved hiking and being outdoors and Especially, like I mentioned, I liked going to the beach, uh, and I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist, and um, I went to college and realized I could study insects, I can study reptiles, I can study birds, I can study plants, and uh, so now I study everything. I still, of course, love the ocean, and I do get to study the ocean from time, but um, I really get to look at everything now, which I, I really enjoy. That's awesome. What do you enjoy most about your career? Uh, so I love learning new things. Uh, I, every day, even though I've been a biologist now for almost nine years, uh, I get to see new things every day, which is really exciting. My days are different. No day is the same. Sometimes I'm in the mountains. Sometimes I'm in the desert. Sometimes I'm by the beach. It just depends on what I'm doing. And the... Uh, different things that I get to do makes my job exciting. And sometimes I get to see an endangered species or a rare plant. And it's just, it's 
so exciting to me. And then I go home and tell my family about it. <laughs> Can you describe what a typical day looks like at your job? Yeah, so especially in the spring and the summer, I get up really early and I go look for uh, endangered and rare birds. Uh, so some of the birds that I look for are burrowing owls. And so burrowing owls, they are active really early in the morning or late in the evening, that's called a uh, crepuscular. And these little owls, they live underground. And so I get to go out and, and find these owls that live underground. Um, another bird that I look for, it's called an endangered uh, coastal California gnat catcher. And there's the, they're pretty little, there's these little songbirds. And um, I love watching them because they've got a lot of personality and um, their call, it sounds like a, a cat meow. So they're fun. <laughs> so that sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, that's a typical day. Sometimes I get to go hiking and I write down all the plants that I see. And then um, I go back to the office and write a report about all the, everything that I saw and then how are we going to protect these endangered plants and animals that I saw out in the field. Sounds like your day is pretty busy. Do you have a favorite thing about your day? I do. So my, my favorite thing to do are, is the bird watching um, when I get to go look out uh, for birds. It's just for me to be outside and sit down and just watch a bird and see what it's doing. If you sit and watch long enough, they'll show you what their little world is like. And if you listen, you can start to see what their little calls mean and how they talk to each other and communicate to other birds. So to me, the bird watching and the bird surveys are my favorite part of my job. That would probably be my favorite part too. Um, does your career require a high school diploma, community college, technical degree, a four-year college? What type of education? So it's definitely, uh, if you're interested in becoming a biologist, I recommend a uh, four-year college, a high school diploma and a four-year college. Um, I went to Cal State Long Beach and uh, I got my bachelor's degree there. Um, but you don't have to go straight to a four-year university. You could start at community college and then transfer to a four-year university. Um, and then if you really love school, you can go to school longer. And like I did, I, I went back to school and I um, got what they call a master's degree. And that just gives you more training and it gets you prepared for, um, for your job. That sounds like a good route. What were your favorite classes or courses that you had to take? Uh, my favorite class, uh, so in elementary school, I always loved science. And then middle school and high school, I took biology classes. Um, and then in college is where it gets fun. So my favorite class that I took in college is called herpetology. And that's the study of reptiles and amphibians. And we went out to the desert and camped on for field trips. And we just spent the weekend catching lizards and snakes and identifying them and studying their habitats. And it's the best of both worlds, camping, hiking, and reptiles and amphibians all in one weekend, so. That's pretty fun. How <laughs> does your job change? Um, does it change often? And if so, how do you keep up with all the new knowledge and skills? So my job does change and it changes when laws that protect animals and plants change um, or water uh, laws that protect water and air. Um, so when those laws change, it affects my job. I have to know how those laws change and um, how the new how the new laws are protecting those things so i uh definitely have to keep up on that sometimes new species become endangered so i have to keep an eye on that uh, so to keep my knowledge updated i'm taking classes um on my own and so i've taken uh bird classes i've taken classes to, how, to teach me how to find uh desert tortoises um, so I'm always looking for new opportunities to, uh, to learn more and to uh, make sure that I'm keeping up with how my job is changing. That's really interesting. How often do you work with birds in your career? 
So I, I probably would say birds and plants are the, the most common things that I work with, but especially birds, because birds right now are in trouble. They're losing their habitat. The climate is changing. And so birds are really important. There's a lot of birds that are endangered that you know we're trying to protect. Um, so I go out and I look for birds before you know a construction project uh, goes out to make sure there's no endangered species. And if there are, how am I gonna protect them? Um, another big part of my job is in the spring and the summer, I go out and I go find uh, nests. And so uh, there's nests, all kinds of places. You have to know where to look. I found nests in underground, like the burrowing owls. I found uh, nests in a tree um, and uh, holes in a tree, like a kestrel nests in cavities in trees. Um, I've even found nests next to railroad tracks. There's a little bird called a kill, kill deer and they sometimes nest next to railroad tracks. <laughs> so my job is to find them and figure out how to protect these nests and make sure that the babies and the eggs don't get hurt. How can we as just citizens better observe birds and help protect birds in our own neighborhoods? So birding is one of those hobbies that you can do anywhere at any time. You don't need anything to do it. Binoculars are nice, but you don't have to have them. Um, you Even in the middle of the city, I am always listening and looking for birds. I can't help it. Once you know what they sound like and what they look like, you're always looking for them. So when I'm just walking around my neighborhood, I'm listening and you'll be amazed in 10 minutes I've heard 15 different birds. So um, it's just that patience and practice of um, learning what they look like and what they sound like. And, you know, the more people that look for these birds, the more we care about them and the more people that are going to want to protect them. So that was really great. Thanks you again, Miss Singleton, for sharing with us how you became a biologist and all the cool birds you get to work with on a daily basis. Is there anything else you'd like to give to any of our viewers here today? Any advice, any tips, anything like that before we say goodbye? Yeah, so if you want to be a biologist, it's a great career path. I love my, I love my job. Um, it's so important to love what you do. So if you have an interest in biology, I definitely encourage you to pursue it. You know, people told me I was going to change my mind someday, but since I was five, I knew I wanted to be a biologist. So it's hard work. You have to work hard. You have to have patience, but in the end, it's worth it. It's a great job. And in the end, you can do something that you love and get paid to do it, so. Thank you so much for your interview. It was really nice talking to you. We we'll hope to see you soon. A great one. Bye, everyone. Bye. Alrighty, my friends, I hope you really enjoyed that interview with Ms. Singleton telling us all about how she became a biologist and the things that she works with on a daily basis. Right now, we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to go into our science portion for today. So today I actually got with me, I brought with me some of my bird friends and we're going to get to introduce them in just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to talk about birds in general for a bit. And this is something you're gonna to get to interact with actually in our chat as well. So I want you to think about if I were wandering around our neighborhood, my neighborhood, maybe yours, what, how would I know a bird is a bird? If I saw an animal in my neighborhood, what is the one thing I could look at it and say, that's a bird? What characteristic does it have? I'll give you a moment, go ahead and type it in the chat if you think you know, and I'm gonna give you some options too. So my options for you today are number one, a beak, number two, wings, number three, it's feet, or number four, it's feathers. Go ahead and type in the chat what you think. I'll repeat that again. Number one, it's beak, number two, it's wings, number three, it's feet, or number four, it's feathers. Go ahead, and I'll ask Miss Brown, what are we seeing in there? We're seeing a lot of wings and beaks. A lot of wings and beaks. 
So we do know that birds are able to fly, most of them, they have those wings. Some of them do have beaks, but actually birds aren't the only animals that have beaks. I know it sounds crazy, but even octopus and squids have beaks too, underneath all those tentacles. So we know it's not that one. And birds themselves too, they have wings, but so do things like insects and bats as well. So my friends, that leaves us with the feet and the feathers. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, the birds have very unique feet that we're gonna talk more about later today, but we have feet too. Most all animals have feet in some capacity, so that's not what makes them special. You see, the thing that makes them special is their feathers. Birds are the only animals on this planet that have feathers. No other animal on this planet has feathers. Even penguins, those are birds. Their feathers might be really, really small, but they're still birds. They can't fly though, but that's okay. We have birds that can fly, like most of them, and birds that can't fly, like penguins, ostriches, emus, things like that. So the correct answer to that is feathers, my friends. Now feathers can come in many, many shapes, sizes, colors, patterns, anything like that. And they all have different purposes depending on the bird. My friends, I'm going to go get our first friend to meet. And while I do that, I want you to be thinking about what purpose feathers might have for a bird. And when I come back, I'm, you can go ahead and type that in the chat. Maybe write it down on a piece of paper. When I come back, we're going to discuss that. And maybe Miss uh, Brown can give us some of your ideas. So I'll be right back with my first bird friend. Good girl. Let me get your stand. All right, my friends, this is Olive. And now before I talk a little bit more about Olive, I wanna go see if we have some ideas in the chat. What do we see in there? Ooh, feathers might help birds keep warm. I really like that idea. Is there anything else there? Yes, that feathers might help a bird fly. Feathers might help a bird to fly. Interesting ideas, my friends. Now I have Miss Olive here and she's an Amazon parrot. And she's got these beautiful feathers that she's just ruffling for us. And we're gonna see if she wants to stand on her stand. It looks like she does. She's just gonna hang out there while I kind of talk to her a little bit. My friends, I want to point out her feathers because she has one of the most beautiful sets of feathers of any bird that I know. And let's talk about what they're used for. So I want to talk about the things that's first put in the chat. Feathers are used to keep birds warm. You know, I would agree with that. Feathers are a great um, way to keep birds warm. They do not have fur, and so they rely on these feathers to be able to provide warmth for their bodies. They are warm-blooded, just like humans. So it'd be like if humans put on a coat, that's kind of how the feathers are. Not only that, but they do also help them to fly. They help provide lift by waving their wings and it provides space for the air to go through and kind of traps it and allows them to fly even better. But also, not all birds are as colorful as she is. The bird's feathers can also be a way to be able to see their families. They can recognize families of birds or birds that are the same species as them by their coloration of their feathers. So um, Olive here knows that if she sees another bird with her same patterns, that that's probably an Amazon parrot. It's probably something like her, and she might wanna go hang out with them. Birds are often very social creatures, especially parrots. They love to hang out in flocks, which is a group of birds, and sometimes they can be upwards of 100, even thousands of birds. Now my friends, these feathers also help provide balance, specifically the tail feathers that we see here on the back. They kind of work like our arms. If we were to hold our arms out like this to try to balance, that's how her tail feathers help. So they do all sorts of jobs and they're all really cool. My friends, that's not the only thing that we can see on Olive that's pretty interesting. 
I want to point out also her beak. So I do want to talk about her beak as well. Birds have many different types of beaks and many different shapes. And the shape of their beak is determined by for what they eat. So all of here is a parrot. And parrots eat a few different things. They eat berries, fruits, seeds, and insects as well. So Olive is an omnivore. She eats both fruit, which is plants, and bugs, which are meat. So she eats both plants and meat. She is an omnivore. And her beak is specially made to be able to handle all those things. It is very round shaped uh, with a point at the end. That is for peeling the fruit that she is able to eat and also for cracking seeds. Here, I'll show you a little bit of how she's able to do that. Here, you want a treat? One of her favorite treats are sunflower seeds. We give her these to tell her that she's doing a good job whenever she does something that's good. So she really is able to crack these seeds quite well. Very little effort involved in that. All right, my friend Olive, what else should we tell them about? Why don't we tell them about your feet? As you can see here, Olive is perched on this uh, perch here. She likes to sit up top here. And I want you to take a notice at her feet. They're a little bit weird looking. As you can see, two are facing forward, two are facing back, and they're kind of able to grab on to the perch. These are what we call perching feet. They're almost as unique as her beak. They are able to do specific jobs that they need to be able to do. Olive lives in a rainforest. There's a lot of trees in that area and she is able to use those feet to be able to hold on to tree branches so that she doesn't fall off. There's other birds that live down on the ground and they have a different sort of feet, but olives are very special perching feet. All right, my friends, I think that's just about all I have. Yes, do we have a question? Yeah, Jack wants to know if colorings can help for either camouflage or mating. Yes, very good, Jack. Those are usually two jobs, so like I said. Um, they can also be used to find different species. So for instance, Olive here, if she's looking for a mate, she knows that it's the right species by the coloration of her, the other bird's um, patterns. Usually the brighter a bird's feathers are, the healthier the bird is. So when she wants to pick a mate or something like that, she looks for a bird with really, really bright feathers. They can also be used for camouflage. I have another bird I'm going to show you that's a little bit better at this. Um, hers is usually for display or that mating ritual, but also in the rainforest there's a lot of green trees, so these help to camouflage as well. Do we have any other questions? Somebody asked if birds are ever hot because of their feathers. They can get warm, so they can get warm just like we get warm. Um, if they're in a hot place like the desert or maybe in a place that has a heater, it's getting a little warm. Uh, they can't control their body temperature as well. Um, and they can get actually heat exhaustion similar to how humans can too. Good questions. Otherwise, everyone thinks she's very pretty and cute. I agree. Like I said, she's one of my favorite. All right, Olive, are you ready to say goodbye? Let's see if you'll do your trick for me. Come on. Oh, you're being a little naughty, aren't you? Treat. Come on. There you go. Can you high five? High five. You want a high five? Come on. Ah, oh, she's being shy for the camera, my friends. She knows some tricks, so she's very smart. So she sometimes will high five. But doesn't look like today. That's okay. I know. We're getting used to it. All right. Bye, Olive. All right, my friends, before we move on to our next bird friend, we go ahead and put this away because we have a little bit of a different type of bird we're going to talk about. So we talked about how Olive is able to eat fruits, nuts, things like that, seeds and grubs. The next two birds that we're going to meet, they do not eat fruit. They are meat eaters or carnivores. All they eat is things like meat. And we're going to talk a little bit about two different ones that we can find here in California, here in Orange County. These are both native birds. They're birds that are found on our neighborhoods, at our parks, in our wilderness areas, and they're very important to our ecosystem as well. 
and I want to talk a little bit more about some of the characteristics that they have before I bring them out. All birds that fly have what's called a hollow bone. Now hollow bones are different from solid bones. Us as humans, mammals, most animals have solid bones. What that means is that they're very heavy, they're very dense, but birds that fly have hollow bones. There's holes inside of this bone that makes it very, very light weight. It's not filled like the solid bone or the solid bone. And so this hollow bone allows them to be able to fly. This is what makes birds able to fly is how lightweight their bones are. So the birds we have here today have the special ability to fly. They are trained, so they're not going to. But this is one of the key factors that helps them to be able to do that. Now the next bird I'm going to introduce you to, we're going to talk a little bit about the wings of this bird. So that's what we're going to be focusing for this bird. And I have three different types of wings I want to show you, and then we can think about which one our next friend has. So the first type of wing I want to show you is this one here. This is an owl wing, and an owl wing is pretty unique. It's fairly short for an owl. That's because they, when they hunt, they like to go through trees and bushes, so it has to be fairly short. Now, at the ends of these, their feathers are what we call fringed. There's spaces between the feathers, almost like if you took your hand and went like this. Those spaces allow for air to pass through them and give owls a very silent flight. They want to be able to be very, very silent when they're flying through. They don't want to spook their prey. It also is very rounded, almost D-shaped like this, and that is so that they can be able to give power to their wings, to be able to propel themselves through the forest, through the plants, and move around those quite easily. The next type of wing I want to talk about is this one here. This one is much larger. This is the wing of a red-tailed hawk. So this is a large bird of prey. Now these hawks, they spend most of their day soaring through the air, really, really up high in the sky, much higher than any of our other birds would like to do. And so they need large, large wings. And it's not quite a D shape like we saw on this one. It's more flat here. So it's not rounded at the base of it. It's more flat. And that's so that they can be able to hold themselves really up high in the sky. So my friends, that's this wing, and this is of a hawk. The third type of wing I want to talk about is this one here. This is called a diving wing, and it's got a very, very long tip, kind of cuts down, and then bulges out a little bit near the base. This wing is wonderful for making high-speed changes in their direction or pattern. So this wing is wonderful for that. A lot of the birds that we see that are either seabirds, this is of a seagull. Seabirds need to be able to make their changes over the land and ocean and deal with the wind currents there. Or birds of prey that hunt other birds. And that's what we're going to meet next, is we're going to meet a bird of prey that hunts other birds. And they need to be able to make quick decisions in order to catch their prey. My friends, as I bring out my next bird, I want you to be thinking about what types of prey this bird might eat and how does its wings help it to survive. I'm really excited about this one. She is my favorite bird that we have here today. All right, let me go ahead and get her stand. My friends, this is ivy, and ivy is an American kestrel. Now, I, before I point out more about her, I want to talk about what she's wearing and what I'm wearing. You see, since ivy is a bird of prey, she has very, very sharp nails at the bottom of her feet. I can show you a little bit here if we can get a zoom in on this. This is what the nails of her feet look like. 
They're very sharp, very pointed. They are called talons, my friends. And these talons, I don't really want them in my skin. So I wear a protective glove. Not only does it protect me, but it also protects Ivy here because she has something to be able to hold on to when she's on my wrist. Now you might see that she has a leash attached to her. This is called a jess. And what a jess is, is it's something to be able to hold birds of prey such as falcons, kestrels, owls, hawks, all of that. She has little bracelets on her legs. Those do not hurt her. It's simply like putting a collar on your dog, except it goes on the bird's ankles because we don't want to put it around their neck because that's not comfortable for them. Does not hurt her as what well at all. It just allows us to be able to hold on to her so that if she gets spooked or anything tries to fly off my glove, she doesn't end up hurting herself. Um, I have a control of her. So that's why she's wearing this here today before I put out. It doesn't hurt them. It's actually much safer for them to be able to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and put her on her stand, and then we can talk a little bit more about her. Want to go on? Oh, that's okay. You're okay. So my friends, you can see there that she's trained to be able to jump back onto my glove. So that's what she's doing there. You want to feel there? No? That's okay. I can just hold her. Sometimes they get a little nervous, sometimes they don't want to go on there. So we'll just go ahead and hold her. Here, you want to flip around? There you go. There you go. So sometimes they have to write themselves, my friends, when they're on the glove, but that's okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about Ivy, because you might be noticing something a little bit different about her head. So my friends, she shakes her head around like this because Ivy is actually 100% blind. She was found in the wild like this, found on the side of a trail actually, 100% blind by some hikers. They didn't know what to do, so they called um, a local rehabilitation center for animals with injuries. And they called them and they determined that Ivy probably couldn't live in the wild on her own anymore. You see, birds of prey like her, they rely on their eyesight to be able to hunt their food. Without that, there's no chance of them being able to find food or even catch food. So my friends, we were able to take Ivy in so that she has another second chance at life, is able to eat, is able to teach kids like you about birds as well. So my friends, this is Ivy, and like I said, she's an American kestrel, and she is a bird-eating bird. In the wild, she would hunt birds straight out of the air. So she has these diving wings. I just hit myself in the face. These diving wings, my friends. This is what allows her to be able to hunt those birds. This really nice shaped, V-shaped uh, wing. As you can see, she has coloring as well. Uh, her coloring serves two purposes on her feathers. It serves both the purpose for finding mates and also for camouflage as well. So hers serves both. Uh, she lives in tall trees, and so this kind of reddish brown coloring behind her helps her to blend into those trees, helps her to camouflage. But if you can see, she's got grayish blue around the crown of her head, and that's to help find mates as well. The males look a little bit different. So the males will have a lot more of this blue color, and depending on how vibrant that blue color, tells them how healthy that bird is as well. All right, my friends, before I put Ivy back, does anyone have any questions in the chat? Michelle wants to know how a bird's um, wings and feathers can support them when they fly. Ooh, that's a really good question. Goes a little bit above physics, so it's a lot of physics, but in the sense, it basically prevents the wind from going through their wings. So as the wing is going down like this, it traps air between the wing and the ground and pushes the ground, the wind pushes the ground, which then pushes the bird back into the sky. It's kind of how it works. It's a lot more detailed than that, but that's essentially what it does, is it pushes air down, that air then pushes the wing up and allows them to be able to fly. Good question. There's Eddie? some concern about the wings on the table and how you got them. 
That is a good question. And this is a question I get quite often. I want you to know, my friends, that I have not killed any birds that you see here today. Things have a natural way of passing. All animals pass away eventually. We at Inside the Outdoors have a permit to be able to take parts from the animals that have passed away. And instead of just having them buried or fed to something else, we are able to use the parts in their memory to be able to teach students like you more about these birds without having to take live birds out of the wild. So that's why I have these here today. So yes, they are 100% real, but I did not kill anything to get them here today. They just passed of normal causes. And lastly, Ivan wants to know if, if she would have been dangerous in the wild. Ooh, dangerous to who? That's the question. To humans, not very much. As you can see, she is quite small. Um, so they're very shy creatures. They don't want to attack humans or anything like that. If you got close to a nest that maybe she had, then probably she might want to attack you to save her babies, tell you to get away. But she's not going to just grab onto you or anything like that. Dangerous to birds and small mammals and bugs? Yes. Very dangerous to them. She is a predator, so she is able to eat those animals. And I guess it should be dangerous to them. Great questions, everyone. All right, my friends. I'm going to go ahead and put Miss Ivy back. Everyone say, bye, Ivy. There you go. Alrighty, my friends, before we meet our last animal, I want to talk a little bit more about it. Like we've been doing, I've been showing you some props. I have these two props here, and I'll try to put them on the table so we can get them a little bit closer. These are two different skulls that I have here. This first one is of a red-shouldered hawk. So this is a first type of bird of prey. The second one here is of a barn owl. Now these are real skulls, like I said. Same deal with the feathers and the wings. Uh, it's from animals that have passed away. Now, this one here, this red-shouldered hawk, you can see that it's a lot shorter and a little bit wider at the base. Now, the red-shouldered hawk's eyes usually sit kind of near the sides on the front of it, and this so they can be able to see their food and find everything there. But the owl's eyes are a lot different. You can see the cavity for the eyes is a lot bigger it's because owl's eyes are much, much bigger than a hawk's eyes. And there's one reason for that. I want you to type in the chat while I bring out my next friend. Why do you think owls need such big eyes? What do you think about them? Where do they live? What time of day do they live? That they would need such big eyes. When we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. All right, my friends, this is Archie, and he is a western screech owl. And I asked you to type something in the chat while I was getting him out. I asked you to tell me, why do you think he has such big eyes? What do you think the purpose of them is? Did we get any responses? We did. Emilio says, because they look for small things and are awake at night. Ooh, Emilio, I would agree with you. 
These types of animals, they eat a lot of mice, and mice are very small. Things like mice, rats, shrews, very small mammals. That's what they eat, and I agree. They do need to find things that are really small, so their eyes have to be really big. Also, they are awake at night, my friends. Owls are what we call nocturnal. So they are awake at night. They do not stay awake during the day. They hunt at night. And so their eyes need to be able to be big because the bigger the eye, the more light that goes in and the easier it is for them to see at night. Now, I know you're all probably wondering this, so I'm going to go ahead and answer it now. Can owls turn their heads 360 degrees all the way around? The answer is no, but kind of yes. So owls cannot turn it in 360 degrees in a complete circle because that would hurt their neck. They, their neck, they still do have a neck, so turning it 360 wouldn't be very good for them. But they can turn it 280 degrees in either direction. So they can look one way almost all the way. They can look the other way almost all the way. And you can actually see that now. They're actually even able to lift their chin up and put their chin up to the sky. So it also works in that direction now, too. So my friends, that's how big their eyes are. And he is not a baby. He is a full-grown western screech owl. So you can find these in our local parks. You can find them um, in your neighborhoods as well. And their feathers aren't much for mating or finding mates. They're mainly for camouflage. So I want you to take a moment to look at his feathers and think about where best he might camouflage into. I'll give you just a moment before I tell you. So go ahead and write it down, write it in the chat. Think about that. Where do you think he would blend into the best? Hmm. Well, my friends, he actually blends best into the California oak trees that we find here, specifically the coast live oak. These animals love to make their nests. Oh, that's okay. Sometimes that happens, right? We work with animals. They love to make their nests in the holes of oak trees. So if a limb falls off or a cavity forms or maybe an old woodpecker hole that kind of grew, they'll burrow in there, they'll make a nest and be able to have their babies in the hole of that tree. And because of that, the females and the males both watch over the nest. They need to match the bark of that tree. And I've seen some of these in the wild and it's really hard to tell that they're even there. Now my friends, another cool thing about him is since he is able to stay at night, he actually has feathers on his talons. So he has feathers on his claws that kind of work like socks. They're able to keep him warm, keep him safe when it gets a little cold at night. All right, my friends, is there any questions about Archie here? So we feed Archie, because he's in captivity, we feed him something a little bit different than what he maybe would eat in the wild um, because of what's available to us and our company. Um, but we do feed him mice. So he is able to eat mice. His mice, when we feed them to him, are not alive. Um, so he doesn't need to hunt them because that's not safe for him, especially if he's going to be in there for a while. Um, so we do feed him mice, sometimes also chicks. Um, but in the wild, he would eat mice, rats, uh, small animals as well. So things like shrews and um, moles too. So that's mainly what he would eat. Any other questions? Someone noticed that the black part of his eyes seemed to change in size, and they're wondering what Ooh, would happen. That's a good question. So just like our pupils and our eyes will change depending on how much light is given to them, uh, so do his eyes. So if there's more light, if he's facing the light, his eye, the pupils will shrink. And then if a place that's a little bit darker, his pupils will widen again. It's a good question. Now, my friends, one of the reasons that he's able to move his head around like that is because unlike humans, owls cannot move their eyes independently. So we can look up, we can look side to side and down without having to move our heads. Owls cannot. They can't move their eyes without moving their heads. So that's why they need to be able to look any direction so they can look for predators 
and also look for prey, their food. Any other questions for me today? Yeah, the students want to know if owls lay eggs. They do. All birds lay eggs, so they are able to lay eggs. Very good question. And there's a wish from the camera angle if they can see closer up on his beak. <laughs> his feet are one of my most favorite things. They kind of look like little fluffy socks. All right, my friends. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to put him back. I have one more thing I'd like to share with you before we wrap up for the day. So I'm going to go put him back. All right, my friends, this is a little bit of a treat for us. You're so interested in what he eats, and I want to tell you a little bit about owls and a little bit more about their digestion. So owls, when they eat things, they like to eat them whole. They will simply scarf down a full mouse, a full shrew, whatever they can fit in their mouth. Now, owls don't have teeth. None of our birds have teeth. They only have those beaks. And so... They can't crush up the bones, they can't crush up the feathers, they don't have the digestion to be able to do that. So what happens is when an owl eats something, it fully eats it, digests what it can, and then there's a special pouch in its throat, actually, that holds all the bones and the fur. And when that gets filled, they simply toss it back up. It's not necessarily vomit because it actually never reached the stomach, it's not poop or anything like that either. So I have some things here. They're called owl pellets. And you can actually tell a lot about an owl and what it ate if you find these pellets. So I'm going to pull one out so we can take a look in it. So if we want to zoom in, this is what the owl pellet looks like. If we can get a good picture, picture of that. And there's a whole bunch of fur and feathers and all these bones can even see in this one, there's a full rat skull in there as well. So it looks like that got a lot of digestion. So there's things like jaw bones, like this one here, there's another jaw bone. There's even little bits of arms and legs, depending on what the owl was able to eat. So there's quite some interesting things. One of the fun things to do that we do with Inside the Outdoors, when we are working with students, so we actually have students pick through these owl pellets as well to see what they can find that the owl ate. Kind of like a mystery, right? All right, my friends. That is our owl for today. Are there any other questions about the owl or anything we talked about here today? If you want to dig through them, my suggestion was to be to look online. There's actually a few companies that actually sell owl pellets. That's probably the most easiest way to make sure that you're not getting your hands in anything that's kind of nasty or might carry some stuff. My recommendation would not be to go find them in your neighborhood or anything like that, but you can look online as well. My friends, I really hope you enjoyed today's uh, lesson all about birds. I'm really happy to be able to share this with you. Now, before I go, I want to tell you a little bit more about what you can do to be able to uh, continue learning about birds on your free time. If you follow the link in our description, you'll be linked to Orange County Department of Ed's Inside the Outdoors uh, homepage where you can find family engagement activities for students, parents, families, whatever you want. Now, if you go on there, you'll see something called the Backyard Missions. And these are especially for families to be able to go out in their own neighborhoods and look for things like birds to learn more about them. Now, Orange County Department of Ed, Inside the Outdoors, will be back with you in the next couple months to talk about some different topics. I believe our next one's actually on space. So that'll be really fun. So make sure you tune in for that. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone.